Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part time musician who wants to go full time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. On the Profitable Musician Show, we give you practical tips and strategies to increase the income you're already making and tap into new streams so you can create more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. We also help you think like a business owner so you can keep more of the money that you make. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, author of the best-selling book, The Musician's Profit Path, and host of the popular Profitable Musician Summit. And as you can probably tell, I am obsessed with helping musicians like you to build a rock solid fan base and income foundation so you can fund the music you are driven to create, share your message with the world, and fulfill your God-given purpose as a musician without stressing out about where your next dollar is gonna come from. You've got the talent. You just need the marketing and business tools to take it to the next level. Now let's dive in to the Profitable Musician Show. All right, I am here with Tara Simon, and I'm excited to get to know her and for you guys to get to know her and find out a little bit about her journey so far as a musician and how she works with musicians now. So Tara, can you give us a little bit of background on your journey? Yeah, absolutely. So, hey guys, thanks for having me and thanks so much uh, to you for having me as well. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, a really quick cliff notes, because it's a long story, is that I've known I wanted to be a singer since the age of three. Um, I thought that the image of my career trajectory was going to be that I was going to be a performer and I trained for it. I did, I moved to New York the day I turned 18. I did Broadway at 19, lead role in fame, toured Europe, came back. Something always seemed to be missing though. And when I was performing and somehow, um, no matter where I went or what I did, somebody would always ask me after performances, oh, I have this daughter, I have this grandson, like, do you coach? I'm like, no, I'm a performer, I do not coach. Thank you, goodbye. And it would be so frustrating to me, like, no matter where I went, and I always shut that door. Um, as years passed, and um, I was living in a place where there really wasn't much to do at the time. I, I, was, I found myself living in Greenville, South Carolina for a few years. And so I was kind of forced to like look at my day and be like, okay, how do I monetize this by doing something that I actually want to do sort of, and it's in my wheelhouse. I can't really perform that many places unless I move again. Um, and so the door was open for me to, uh, to coach this young man named Peter Rose. He was 11 and he wasn't even a vocalist, he was a pianist, but he had Down syndrome and was told no, basically everywhere he went. Mm. And like, you can't do this, you don't have the capability. And that really made me mad. So his parents brought him to me one day. I wasn't even advertising lessons. I don't know how they found me still to this day. And um, he came and he played a 17 page Chopin piece for me in my living room. And I looked at his parents and I said, look, um, I'm gonna put the cards on the table here. This kid's a better pianist than I am right here right now, but I can promise you one thing. I'm never gonna tell him no. And I'm always gonna be just as hard on him as I am to any other student that I would ever coach. Mm. And um, fast forward a couple years later, um, God used Peter to change my heart towards coaching. And I found deep purpose and meaning in it. And I found that it was actually a really high calling in my life and the image of the way I was supposed to be using music and my talent was not really self-serving as a performer, um, which is fine for others to do. I think it's great. But for me, my sweet spot is in pouring into others. It's really what I find that I get more joy, more purpose, more satisfaction out of. Um, so as my heart changed towards coaching, um, the business turned into, well, what was a living room thing turned into an actual business. And I realized that genuinely caring about the human condition by way of music was something that was a real hot commodity. No one was really doing it. Mm. And, um, I moved to Atlanta and I opened up a brick and mortar in Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, this was a couple years into coaching Peter. He came to visit one, one day shortly after new year's. 
a few years back, about five years back actually now. And he got to see the studio and I sat him down on the white piano that I have, where I do all my YouTube videos on everybody. I'm sure who knows me knows the piano. And I sat him down. I said, Peter, do you know where you are? And he said, yeah, I'm at your studio, your new studio. I said, yep. And do you know why it's here? And he said, no. And I said, it's because of you. Hmm. And, um, we hugged and we actually have video of that. It was really, really meaningful to me for him to get to see that because Peter was fighting for his life. He got bone marrow leukemia and um, he had been going through chemo at that point for a little over a year. We would have piano lessons in his hospital room. I would take my keyboard and we would play. And, um, and I still wasn't any easier on him then, bless his heart. <laughs> um, but uh, that year Peter died of bone marrow leukemia. And, um, and so I carry him in my spirit every day. I carry his legacy with me my coaches and everybody at the studio knows about Peter because without Peter, I don't know if I ever really would have gotten it. I don't know if I ever really would have understood my why. And I think that's really probably the most important thing for any entrepreneur listening to this, whether you're in music or not, is it's really easy to like get obsessed and entrenched in the product, right? Whatever that may be, whether it's tangible, intangible. Um, but, and, and you know, you talk about, oh, what's, who's my avatar? Like, who am I selling to? And, and you're in, obsessed with the analytics and you're obsessed with like this, this data that you can collect in order to capitalize on it. But behind every piece of data is like a breath and behind every piece of analytics is a heartbeat. And really that's, as I started to care about the heartbeat and, and realize my why, that is when my business just kind of exploded and I had to hire coaches. And I, again, I had to open up a space and, and do courses and, and, and all of those things just snowballed as a result of operating out of a sweet spot that had a genuinely, honestly good intent for other human beings. And so I don't care if it's a service that you provide or if it's a product that you offer, it's, it's so much about the service of what you do and your, and your level of expertise towards others rather than the bottom line dollar amount or what you can get out of it. You're going to get what you need out of it anyway, but it's that law of attraction where if you, if you serve and you put things forth that are, are benefiting others, especially when it comes to their human condition, it's going to come back to you. And, and it really has for me tenfold. I, I live such a blessed life. Um, I love my life. I love what I do so much. It, it's, I'm a workaholic, not because I'm obsessed with money, but because I just can't seem to stop doing what I love to do. I get that. I know. I know. I, I feel like I'm a workaholic too, but for a good reason. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't ever feel like I'm, I'm way overworking myself because I'm, I'm enjoying a lot of it. So I, I totally get that. I'm curious because I know we we're talking about your why and and as you said, like for you, it just turned out that performing wasn't your why. It wasn't the way that you were, that you felt the, like you were having the most impact on the world and coaching was. Now, of course, some musicians, their why will be performing, right? So I'm curious how, how did it feel different to you versus when you were performing in fame and all the places yeah. you were performing, like how did the impact that you had there feel different than the one when you started to realize, oh my gosh, coaching is my calling? Well, I, it, I can give you a really good visual uh, depiction of that, actually. So um, in fame, I was about two, two and a half months in. We did nine shows a week, by the way, instead of eight, because we were oh, sold out. Wow. It was insanity. I mean, it, yeah, we're not going to- What part that. did you play, by the way? I was Serena Katz. Oh, wow. So, That's awesome. Yeah, I was. And, and those, those opportunistic producers, they figured out that I could dance. So not only was I the, like the lead singer aside from Carmen, but I, I also was dancing and my role wasn't supposed to dance. So I did all the things. I was so tired. I was always hungry, just overworked. It was great. But I remember two, two and a half months in, <laughs> the curtains were raising and I was yawning. Oh, and I, I got stopped mid yawn by the bright lights hitting my face. And I was like, Oh, this is, this is not good. <laughs> I'm bored. <laughs> oh my gosh. 
So, I mean, here, here I am at the pinnacle of what I thought would be like my career success, right? I, I mean, I went to performing arts high school. I've trained for this all my life. Everybody told me from three, you're going to be on Broadway. Your name's going to be in lights. Like this is your purpose. This is, and I'm living my purpose. What I thought living out my purpose would be. And I'm yawning in the middle of my purpose. And I said, certainly I am missing the mark in some way here. What's going on? So for me, it was, it was the yawn versus the waking up at 6 a.m. so excited to start my day because I know that there are going to be lives that are impacted one-on-one. One one. And so for a performer, like if that's what gets you going, if, if the idea of entertaining and bringing high value and, and your best to a stage where you're inspiring people, maybe there's kids in that audience who are wanting to be like you someday and you sign those autographs afterwards and the applause, like that makes your heart beat faster, then you're in your sweet spot. You need to stay there. There's nothing wrong with that. Like nothing at all. I'm not saying that I chose better. I'm just saying that in my heart, I'm designed to do something different. And I really had to reconcile that for a long time because it was kind of a bit of an identity crisis. I'm like, but, but I'm, I'm a performer. This is not, I am not a coach. This is not who I am, you know, but I feel like God had to speak to my heart and say, no, I, I'm, I am who you are. And I'm telling you that this is, you had the right idea. You're going to sing, but like you had the wrong image of what that looked like in your life. Your, your purpose is missions-based music. Your purpose is to reach one, teach one, not reach masses and get applause. That's all awesome if that's your purpose. It just, I just got it wrong. I thought it was mine and it wasn't. Mm, I, I love that, that imagery of, of when you knew when you yeah. knew that this wasn't quite it. And, you know, whether it's for those that are listening, like whether it's, you are just absolutely fueled by writing amazing songs that, you know, you want to get certain messages or out into the world with your songs. Like it doesn't matter what it is. You'll know when you yeah. hit it, because like she said, you'll get out of bed and you won't be like hitting snooze, <laughs> you know, yeah. you'll be like I cannot wait to get started. <laughs> And there's a, there's a real sense of despair and confusion in the waiting. I, I will be honest with you. So, you know, when, after the yawn, the big yawn, I'll call it of, of 20, of 19, whatever, of 20, what was it? When was it? Of 2002 or 2003, the big yawn of 2003. Um, I came back to, to New York city in my little apartment. I'm like, okay, now I'm up for hairspray. Now I'm up for fiddler on the roof. You know, the, the calls are coming in and I don't want it. Like, what do I, mm. what, who am I here? What am I doing? This feels wrong. It feels like I'm turning down opportunities. You're taught never to turn down an opportunity in music theater. You say yes and figure it out later. But I had to be still, I had to sit and be still and, and just really for, for me anyway, really pray about like, okay, what, what now, like, what do I do? I don't even know really who I am at this point, but if you're willing, for those of you who are listening, if you're willing to sit in that uncomfortability just for a little bit, I promise you, it'll be revealed to you. Don't stay on the wheel that you know you're not supposed to be spinning just because you don't know how to get off and sit still for a second. Because you have to sit still in order to look to the left or to the right and see that new path. There will be a, a point where if you're making a shift, there will be uncomfortability and uncertainty. But just like know that and sit in that and trust that there, there is a new direction coming. Mm, that's really good. That's really good. So when you found that direction, you decided to go out and build a brick and mortar studio and you had that. Do you still have that now? I do. Absolutely. Yeah. It's still turning and burning in Atlanta. Awesome. Now, how has that changed with the pandemic? Like, had you already been doing some stuff online or did you kind of switch modes? Yeah. So, you know, I just, I really feel like we set ourselves up for success unknowingly so long ago. Uh, again, because I started technically coaching in Greenville, South Carolina, and I moved to Atlanta, I eventually moved my students uh, over online to Skype from Greenville because I, I couldn't keep driving back and forth every week as the studio in Atlanta was growing. And so for the past decade, we've been doing lessons online. And then once I started my YouTube channel a couple years ago, our international student base I just, I mean, skyrocketed. So we have been never busier than in COVID because mm -hmm. 
we have it down to a science. Our coaches are very well versed and trained in latency online, knowing how to um, mitigate that, knowing how to coach and get progress out of someone without being in the same room or without needing to touch them. So there, there are a lot of nuances um, that are different between online lessons and in-person lessons. And we really, we kind of, I think as far as, as vocal studios kind of cornered the market on how to make that happen with excellence. And, um, and because of that, like I said, I mean, I would say, I'd say five years ago, our online business versus in-person business was probably 70% in person, 30% online. And now I would, I would probably venture to say easily that our online business is now 85% and our in-person business is 15%. Wow. And you built the systems to be able to take advantage of that. Like you said, you were ready. Yes. And when, when COVID happened, you could just deploy and take advantage of the systems you'd already built. And what I'm interested in is, you know, you, you have a YouTube channel and people find you there. Um, was there any uncomfortability about getting other coaches that you are working with or like, you know, working with your students and stuff? Cause they come to you and they're like, oh, you know, I found you on YouTube. I really want to work with you. Was it weird to like try to duplicate yourself with these other coaches? That's a really great question. And okay, so to be honest with you, I could probably stand to have about 20, 30 coaches under my belt working for me right now. Right now, currently, I have five vocal coaches Mm -hmm. other than myself. And here's the process in which I... I did uh, undergo to hire every single one of them. There's a few things. First of all, one, they have to be working professionals in their craft. I don't consider them if they're not. Two, I stalk them for months before I ever (laughs) let them know that I'm stalking them. So if they're performing out, I will go see them perform. If they've got stuff released, I will listen to it. If they've got a CD opening, I will go to it. And they don't know. I just go. And I watch, I watch how they interact with people. I watch their performance. I want to make sure that they're operating in a level of excellence that's befitting of my brand. And then I make contact with them. Like I will, I will then say, Hey, I've been, I've been watching you. Are you interested in pouring into the lives of others? Because just because you're great at something doesn't mean you're great at coaching. Like you can be a great singer, but a terrible vocal coach. Because there's a difference. The heart is behind it, right? The work is is the art, but the heart behind it is most most important. And so I'll interview them. If I feel like they have the heart and I see that in their interview, then I actually start to train them. And that takes months. So I hand train every single one of the coaches. It takes hours and days and weeks of my time. But I can honestly say by the end of it that they are me with a different face. Mm. And I can confidently rest knowing that any student that comes to me that can't get into my schedule and can get into theirs is going to get the best training that they possibly can get. That's awesome. And that is absolutely the way to do it. So that's, that's great that you have a system and you have complete confidence in everybody that you've hired. I love the whole stalking people. I know for me, I've definitely hired people after watching them and working with them in a different capacity and them mm-hmm. not knowing I was even thinking about asking them, you know, yes. to work for it's me. the best. And to be honest with you, my coaches are, are what enable me to live in a different state and fly up there once a month now to manage. I mean, they, they treat that building like it's their own. They operate with such a high level of integrity. They are, they're not just amazing coaches. They're amazing people. And we have Mm -hmm. such a great family culture at my business that, I mean, we're really tight. We're really tight. Like I'll take them out to dinner when I'm up there. We, we are, we are more a family than we are a business. And I'm, I'm so proud of the team that's been built there. They really are what make me great. So that's cool. You don't even live there. Where do you live? I don't. I I live in Florida now, which is where Uh. I'm from. I have a little boy and it was better for him to be down here with family than fly down here and be alone in Georgia. We don't have any family up there. So I, I fly up instead of us flying down. That makes sense. So you really have built a business that can run without you. It literally does. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about your YouTube channel because I know that you, you know, you've gotten, like you said, you have gotten an international following because of YouTube and you've been able yeah. to build, build your coaching business around the world. What made you think to 
go all in on YouTube? And, and how do you think that you have gotten the success you have on YouTube? That's a, that's a great question. And it's a funny answer actually. So, um, a couple years back I was trying to, because we really didn't do much advertising other than SEO for the business. And so I was like, what if, I mean, what would happen if we actually tried, you know, like we're already doing great. Let me see if I, if I got creative and tried to be more active on social media, like what would happen? And so I hired a videographer to do some videos, some short, um, little one minute Instagram tips and tricks. Right. And we got finished early one day and we had some more time left. And the guy was like, Hey, you want to do like a long format one for YouTube? And I was like, nah, okay. And it happened to be reaction. And uh, he's like, yeah, you I mean, why don't you react to what you think about the singer? And I was like, okay, cool. So I literally just sat down and I picked a video and I reacted to basically what I do every day. I react to people singing and I coach them. Right. So I broke down what he was doing and, and we put it up there and, it, I mean, I started getting subscribers by the thousands instantly. Like Whoa. it was, it was insane. Like 2000 a day, every day for a very, very long time. So do you have a sense of what brought all those subscribers to that video? Was it the title that just hit on what people were searching for? Or did somebody, people share it or something? Uh, no, I, I think <laughs> honestly, it was a matter of good timing and random like blessing. I don't like, so I think that when I released that, the, the vocal coach reactions thing was kind of on the cusp of being a big thing, but also not many coaches were doing it. Mm. So there were only like a few top ones. Now you see a lot of them that are getting on the bandwagon that are just trying to like legitimize, Hey, I'm not hating on them, whatever. But like there weren't as many. So the pool of views was not as saturated. And so I think the fact that I actually knew what I was talking about coupled with the production quality and, um, and just the artists that I was choosing kind of set me apart from the others. Oh, and the other thing is that I, I can actually sing, right? I'm a performer, so I can demonstrate vocally what I'm talking about when I'm reacting. So if someone's doing something and I'm like, oh, they should have done it this way instead, instead of just saying what they should have done, I'll actually sing it so that mm -hmm. people can hear. And I, no other coaches really do that in their reactions. And I don't know why, but they don't. So I'm, that's a very big differentiating factor between me and other reactors. Maybe they do sometimes, but I haven't really seen it. I'm kind of known for that. So kind of walking the walk and talking the talk, so to speak. Um, so I think it was just timing and, and the fact that it wasn't too saturated and that I chose good videos and the production quality was good. And I knew what I was talking about, probably all those things. Mm, that's cool. And, and I think that's an important point that you you did something that wasn't like saturated yet and yeah. may have been by accident, but you know, it was something you did naturally, but it turned out that it was something that wasn't, there weren't so many other videos doing that at the moment. Right. And I wish, like, I know this is frustrating for you guys listening to be like, Oh, of course it was an accident. See, like <laughs> I can never do anything intentional. Like there's no playbook here. I get it. Like, I know that's super frustrating, but here, here's the rub. It wasn't really by accident though, because think about it. I was still trying to do stuff, right? I was filming something else. And while that may not have been my mark, I was still in the attempt mode. I was still going after different things and trying different things. And something just happened to hit. And that's what it's going to be like for you guys. You don't just sit there. You're like, okay, what can I do? I'm going to zig. I'm going to zag. And maybe the zag doesn't work and the zig does, but it's not an accident really because you were still going after things. You were, you were kind of knocking on different doors and one just happened to crack open and you kicked the thing down. That's right. I mean, you do some, you plan something, you do it, say you're doing videos, right? And you don't just put it on YouTube. Maybe you also do Instagram. Maybe you also do Instagram TV and you do reels and you know, you, and you do TikTok. Yeah. you try those things. And one of them will probably hit in some way more than the others. Totally. I'm no, not nearly as big. Don't try, on you won't know. Yeah. And and a testament, I'm not nearly as big on TikTok as I am on YouTube, you know? Not at all. <laughs> right. So find your platform. Do do some testing. Find a platform that you resonate with the best and that they resonate with you and then go all in on it like she has. Exactly. So I know that you are a big proponent of recurring income and finding ways to, to get that like stability in your income for your music career. How can musicians 
really be able to set that up for themselves, especially, you know, now with the focus on doing more things online? Oh man, I am, I am a huge believer and fan and beneficiary of uh, courses. I believe in the online course model. I think that is where the world is headed. And, and I think if COVID has taught us anything, um, it has taught us that we can educate ourselves online just as efficiently as we can in person. And because of that, I mean, it was big before, but I think now more than ever, people are starting to realize that like, oh, I can, I can self-educate. I can do this online. It's just as valuable, if not more, because, and I mean, I don't know about other courses, but if you buy mine, you own it for life right? So like you can go back, it's like watching a movie, you notice new things the second, third, fourth time. So there's value in courses big time. And there's value also in subscription based models. So let's say that you've got a lot of technical wisdom and you release this really great uh, post once a month that people can subscribe to for a nominal fee a month. Well, you know, it's about volume. So it could be that it could be a private Facebook group. That's 10 bucks a month for people that you go on and you do live and you answer questions. I have one of those. If you buy my course, you can do Facebook private for uh, it's called the vocal gym for 10 bucks a month. And I go in there, I answer people's questions. I'll go live sometime. I'll react to a random person just like I do on YouTube and I'll post it privately. Um, there's so many ways to digitally monetize your time and, and make some passive income. You have to answer two questions though first, and I, and I like to back end it. So, so the first is who would you most like to serve period? Like who is that person? And the second question is what in you is valuable that you can give to them? If you can answer those two questions, then you, you have a product. You just have to build it out. So for me, my question, who I, who would I like to serve? I want to serve people who think they can't sing for whatever reason, but mostly if they were told no, if they were told by someone they couldn't, if they were, if, if their confidence is low, I want to rebuild the way they think about themselves. And I want the vehicle to do that, to be through music. That's, that's my person. Okay. And how am I going to do that? Well, I happen to be a kick butt singer and I know all sorts of ways to get through to people and, and helping to explain it in a way that they can understand. And then they can execute themselves, which serves them. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to create ways to make this a course that I can create one time and sell always. And that lots and lots of people all over the world can not only afford, but benefit from. If you can do that for yourself, you've got yourself some courses, you've got yourself some passive income that you can create. It's upfront work and then back end maintenance. Yeah. And you can always combine that, right? You can combine that, like what you're doing with the Facebook group, the vocal gym, you can have that thing that people buy and they can always have it and go back and, but they can also get that ongoing support. That's exactly what we're doing. A hundred percent. Yep. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It's all income. And in fact, everything that I said is something that I'm doing currently. Mm, I love that. I love that. Um, wow. This has been really awesome. I've loved learning about all the ways that you are helping musicians, especially love the part about the why. Cause I think that that's, it's so important. There's so many people right now with what's going on with the pandemic that are pivoting for different reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, some people are pivoting because they have to. Some people are pivoting because they discovered that they actually like doing something a different way that they hadn't even tried before, you know? Yeah. Um, so is there anything else that you want our listeners to know that we haven't talked about? Just that if you're listening to this and you're really not sure what you're doing right now in life or where you should be going, I just encourage you um, to look outside yourself and serve others. Because the answer is always in the service of others. You will find yourself, you'll find your direction when you get your eyes off of you and start looking towards someone else. Mm, I love that. I absolutely love that. Okay, so let them know, how can they find you online? How can they connect with you on social media? How can they find your YouTube channel? If you Google Tara Simon Studios anywhere, you'll find me. You'll find the website. You Google (laughs) Tara Simon Studios on YouTube. You'll find me Instagram. We are all things Tara Simon Studios. Simon is singular. Studios is plural. 
that pretty much sums it up. And if you're interested in learning about um, the courses that we have or you want to get into them or whatever, you can also find that on our website. All of the courses that we have live right now are on the homepage. You just have to scroll down. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure being interviewed by you today. And, and I really hope that you guys as listeners got a lot out of it today. Oh, you are so welcome. Thank you for all of your inspiration and expertise. You're so welcome. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.